That one started with our bass player. Um, he is, if there are minor key people and major key people, he's a minor key person. And I'm more of a major key person. So I rely on these kind of people to help me, take me to the darker side sometimes, because it's tough for me to go there on my own. And Mark has helped me many times <laughs> in that department. And so you can really hear, it feels very ominous, but there is a message of hope in it that happens um, if, you, if you wait for it. And it's obviously the title track for the record. What else about that one? One of our favorite people we've ever worked with is Daniel Lanois. We didn't work with him on this record, but he would say things like, you know, we want to make a, you know, a record that, that when we go to dinner tonight, we walk in with our heads held high. And, and those kind of things stick with you, you know, if, if, you're, if you're receptive to it. And when we made the first demo of Wonderful Wonderful, I, I felt like that when I walked in to get my, my breakfast the next morning, you know. Yeah. Like I, uh, I just, I, was, I knew that I was proud of it and, and, and it, made me feel, it made me feel better about what I was doing. And, and um, so yeah. Ended up making the record. Thank heavens. We love it. It's um, nine years old, but it feels fresh. And I guess a lot of that would be thanks to our producer that we chose for this record, Jack Knife Lee. Musically, uh, production wise, maybe, the song was just sort of uh, a little overcooked, maybe. But we still love the song. We knew that the song was strong and uh, important. And we had to pay it attention and, 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 and get in there and sort of dissect on what's wrong with it. And so we, what we did is we just basically took it down to the studs. I remember Jackknife saying, you know, this sounds like a song that should be um, played in the way that you're a band, you've, you're a new band, and you've only been on your instrument for, for a very short time. So it became much simpler, it became faster. And um, I think it's sort of just... We, we shaped a dart um, with a very pointy edge, and uh, it's, it's aimed straight at your head. The Man's the last song that we wrote for the record, so it's not, it doesn't share um, a lot of commonality with the other songs on the album. There's nothing really like it, but um, it was a welcome surprise for us. It brought out some influences that I've always known that we've had, but have never really emerged before. Um, Mark's, Mark hasn't played, um, you know, hooks like that, I, you know, that I recall since, since Hot Fuss, since our first record, and, and it's exciting to me. And it feels very much like the Killers, but you also hear our influences, you know, like I was saying, that David Bowie and Talking Heads, that haven't been as prominent. Uh, in our last couple records. We kind of had the record done. Like, we were sort of like, it's done. We have a great record here. We, we, okay, and we have some extra time on the clock. It was at the end of the night type of thing. And we started messing around with it without any sort of real um, uh, uh, ethic to sort of uh, get it done or something like that. It was just built straight out of fun, out of experimenting at the end of a night. And that sort of taught us that we don't always have to sort of uh, be working, uh, to, you know, digging <laughs> so so hard. You can just sort of let it be light, and uh, that's that's how this song was born. I just kept thinking about this experience that I had of wa watching Mike Tyson get knocked out by James Buster Douglas, and. You know, some of my favorite experiences growing up were with my dad watching watching fights, and Las Vegas is a very you know boxing-oriented city, and and so much history there with Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston and Mike Tyson and, and all these people. It changed my my paradigm shifted when he was knocked out, and he was you know basically you know one of my heroes, and I saw that he was he wasn't impenetrable. <laughs> he was impregnable. He wasn't iron. You know, he was a man and he was fallible. And, and then his personal life, obviously, other things went out of control after that. And so, 
you know, I, I think I, a lot of people go through those experiences with whether it's their dad or their heroes, could be musical heroes, could be sports heroes or whatever, whoever it is that you're looking up to. And um, seeing them go down like that um, was, a, you know, it was uh, interesting and fun for me to to kind of rip it apart and dissect it. And it helped me in the end, you know, to to go through that process. This is another dark one. Another one started with Mark. Uh, he, we, we were messing around in the studio, and he was. Ta I I I, met, I mentioned something about the leaning into the light, and he had just been looking at this painting by Caravaggio, and it's called The Calling of, of Saint Matthew, and it's obviously about when when Matthew in the Bible is called to discipleship, and Jesus basically just says, you know, come follow me, and and so we looked at the painting and we were able to use that as a launching pad for the song. And it's just, uh, we ended up taking it a little bit somewhere else. It's about a, a son who is going back to his hometown to straighten his, his dad out. And it's, uh, uh, we just played it for the first time a few nights ago and it felt good. And Woody Harrelson is actually reading out of M Matthew in the beginning of the song. So that's Woody in the beginning of the song. <laughs> 